Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is um, June 19th, 2013, and um, we have a really nice group of all writing project people here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we were noticing as we were setting up, that's not always true, but it's uh, really nice. Uh, our topic tonight, um, and I'm getting some echo, by the way, if anybody has... Doesn't matter. Well, we'll figure it out, and we'll we'll silence somebody. But we'll, we'll don't worry. Anyway, hi. <laughs> um, why don't we uh, quickly go around and do introductions? And if you don't mind, um, Stephen, why don't, why don't we start with you? You're 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 kind of one of the people who uh, I don't know incited this conversation. So <laughs> <laughs> we could say it like that. Glad to be an insider. I'm Steve Zemmelman, uh, director of the Illinois Writing Project uh, here in the Chicago area, metro area. And um, I have this website called teacherspeakup.com. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have some questions to people about how to get more teachers writing about their work and uh, how to get it published in the wider media, out to the wider world. Cool. Pat, I know you said you have the flu, but you have to introduce yourself for this. Sure, sure. I'm uh, Patrick Delaney. I am uh, very recently retired from uh, a gig as a librarian in a high school here in San Francisco. And I work with the Bay Area Writing Project, and just back from New York where I saw Paul. And, uh, Stephen, I'm kind of very interested in your topic there because it's something that I've been talking to a bunch of teachers in the Writing Project about out here. Great. Pat, how long have you Great. been with the Bay Area Writing Project? Uh, 1982 was my first summer. Oh, my gosh. Who that? <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. All right. And that, was not a, that was, by the way, that was an open program. That's what actually got me into teaching. That was not an invitational. That came in the 90s. Oh. I had to fight my way in. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do invitations. We're open. <laughs> We don't believe him. So Monica Hardy is with us as well, um, and she's trying to get in here, it looks like. Um, Catherine Schulten, why don't you introduce yourself? If you Hi. Um, I've been a Writing Project member since 87. As I always point out, student taught with Paul Allison when I was mm. 21 or whatever I was then. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I was 23, I, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure, a scant two years ago. Um, now I, uh, I was a teacher for 10 years. I was a literacy consultant through the Writing Project for a while after that. And for seven years now, I've run the um, New York Times Learning Network blog. But the reason I'm on tonight is because it just so happens that I did a keynote for the New York City Writing Project's annual meeting, and my theme was teacher voice. And then Steve and I had a conversation on the phone and exchanged, he had done a keynote. We basically did the same keynote, you know, minus our autobiographical details. On the same um, day. On the, yeah, yeah, on the notion that, you know, it's a time teachers need to speak up and how and why they should do it. So it, what, it, I guess it was the same day. Was it the same day, Paul? Yeah, I think so. It was a Saturday, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. in April. All right then. Yes. It's why it's why I, we some of us couldn't be down there. Right. Uh, in, but yeah, because got scheduled the same thing. Welcome. So uh, the, we'll, we'll, we'll circle, circle back and, and kind of start that way, if that makes sense. You guys will talk about what you talked about in your keynotes, and, and then we'll see where we go. Jenna Choa, welcome. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm Jennifer Ochoa, and I've been a member of the Writing Project since my first summer in uh, at the Red Cedar Writing Project in East Lansing, Michigan in 1992. Um, I taught in Michigan for eight years, and when I moved to New York City in 2000, it made sense for me to figure out where my closest Writing Project site was to find my teacher home, and so I landed at the New York City Writing Project um, in 2000 um, and have been working with them ever since in different capacities. And we actually do have a summer invitational, and so I kind of help work on that a bit. You work on that a bit. Yes. A bit, yeah. <laughs> Although How here, many years now? You've been co-coordinating at uh, uh, four. Oh, four. Yeah, and in New York, we're not actually done with school yet. Um, I teach eighth grade, so it feels like it's going to be 400 more years before we're done with school. So our <laughs> summer invitational hasn't started yet because we still have kids all day. <laughs> Right, especially in middle school, right? I mean, in high school, at least, we're in testing. And yeah, no, we, those 13-year-olds were running around the room today. You go till Wednesday? We go till oh. next Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh. 
Jen, I'm talking about uh, working at a sixth and seventh grade next year, so we should talk more. We, we should. They're hilarious and funny and exhausting and ridiculous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the principal I'm talking to keeps saying, and they're very grateful. They are. Sixth and seventh <laughs> I, I graders, I mean, true. <laughs> you could say, let's pick up garbage from the floor. And if you sound excited enough, they're like, all right. They are just grouchy <laughs> about everything. <laughs> cool. Welcome. Andrea is Elmer. Hi, I'm Andrea Zellner. Um, I did Red Cedar Writing Project in 2005, so oh. I'm but I taught for 10 years um, at high school English and bio, and then I actually worked for Red Cedar for a couple years, going out um, full-time for the Red Cedar Writing Project, working in different schools around Michigan. And then uh, now I'm back in school myself. I'm getting my doctorate in educational psychology, educational technology. And I work in our Masters of Ed Tech program, which means I get to work with teachers all over the world, in fact. Mm -hmm. And so I am also teaching right now, but nobody runs around because they're all online. So. Well. <laughs> I kind of wish all my guys were online. <laughs> yeah, they, they might be running around. They might be in their pajamas. I, I try not to picture what they're doing. So. <laughs> and Andrew, just to make one connection already, uh, you and Stephen uh, Zemmel did a presentation at NCT about this topic. Yes, we did. Want to mention what that was a little bit? Yeah, so we did a series of roundtables, and uh, my roundtable was called Tweeting Truth to Power, I think. That was what it was called. I was, was so <laughs> jealous of that title. <laughs> it's like a aha moment. So anyway, but we um, at my table talked about the power of using Twitter because and other social media channels because when NWP's directed funding, that's the National Writing Project's directed funding, got... Um, removed from the federal budget a few years ago, I really started getting interested in activism and got a lot of response from my elected representatives using social media channels. And so uh, we talked about that at my roundtable. And then Steve and I just are working, I'm not sure what the status of the podcast is right now, but NCTE. I have to do the final edit. Yeah, so, so I, I'll get to it hopefully this weekend. <laughs> After my email comes, right? <laughs> oh, no. I'll do my email, you do the editing. <laughs> and Monica, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us uh, what you're up to these days. Welcome. Well, I'm um, in Loveland, Colorado, and um, still experimenting with the intersection of city and school. Um, yeah. I'm glad to be around all these writing project people. Looking forward to what I can learn from you guys. Super. Okay. You I'm were sorry, a math what teacher, it, right? What does that mean, the intersection of city and school? I'm interested. Um, so the focus has been a lot on self-directed learning, um, but now the focus being the city as an ecosystem where you have cross-generational um, expertise and um, eclectic resources just looking at that ecosystem as the classroom, if you want to call it a classroom still. Um, yeah, our, our focus has just been um, a way to literally redefine public education so that it's not about seat time and test scores, mm -hmm. um, but about attachment and authenticity. Are you known by someone and um, do you talk to yourself every day? <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. thanks. <laughs> So great, as we go. Um, so could I uh, impose, and I, Catherine, I love that you jumped in there, and that's how we do this show. So please keep doing that, you all. Um, and um, the, uh, so, but I want to give some brief structure and, and say that uh, we mentioned two keynotes. Uh, they were in May, I think, if I'm correct. April. Um, April. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> Good. Um, but do you want to kind of summarize a few of the points you made in those keynotes? Can we start with you, Stephen? Just in All right. Uh, I'll, I'll do a quick, quickie, quickie version. Okay. Um, I, I've just been really concerned that um, with so many changes, attacks on education and on teachers and, uh, and budget cuts and so forth, that of not nearly enough teachers speak out about this. Uh, and uh, in some way or other, uh, there are kind of the vocal advocate types, but um, 
many don't, and I've been casting about for how to get more teachers into the public conversation uh, on education and uh, get them writing about it. And um, but I've figured that since so many uh, are fearful of speaking out on policy issues, that perhaps if we could just get them writing about um, just think good things, wonderful things that happen in their classroom. And when you get the stories, when you finally get them, they're gorgeous. I just sent one to Catherine mm -hmm. that I was hoping I, she would just love so much she'd be tempted to publish it somehow. And, um, and, and so uh, I'm looking for ways to do that. And uh, my talk was really about why this is so important. And that was especially relevant in Birmingham because we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the letter from the Birmingham jail and all the activism mm -hmm. that brought change there. And uh, that we need to do that now because especially poor people are really the ones who are going to suffer. They're suffer a bunch of schools closed forever today in Chicago um, with demonstrations and sit-ins and everything else. So um, it's how to get, so my big puzzles and that I, that I was really pushing for in the talk are how to get more teachers writing uh, just about what they do that's really good so people start believing in our work. Uh, more and and then how to get it out there into the public sphere those those are the two challenges and I'm hoping people in this panel will have some ideas about that tonight and uh, I keep looking for more ways to do this and I can tell you a little more about one that I just ran across this afternoon and, and as we've been talking and planning and, and, ba and based on what we did right at the end of May um, a similar show like this um, some of the issues that I think are coming up, if I could throw in, um, have to do with that the, the whole geography, if I could call it that, between those sit-downs and protests and telling the positive story and how we can kind of do both and kind of understand, you know, how, how to enter in both those places, I think, is, is what you might say, Steve. But... Um, that that feels like one tension, and the other tension is um, is around you know there are schools closing, and then there's all this excitement this summer, especially around MOOCs and um, makes and te new technology. Not only just this summer, but in general. So there's all this churning excitement, and at the same time, like the you know budgets are getting cut back and so forth. So. That's, there's some disconnection there for me that I'd like to address here. So those are some of the issues I hope we bring up. <laughs> Catherine, do you want to jump in there and just go go back a little bit and say what you presented at the New York City Rally? Can I, can I just mention one coincidence that I noticed because we each looked at each other's speech notes and we both talked about building our brand. It was so neat that we both used the same word. Oh, but that I, I might have used that word in quotes because I now... I mean, for me, I was talking to friends. I, the writing project's my home. I mean, I was like a baby child when I first started teaching, and it, because of the writing project, I knew what I was doing. Um, and then I was a teacher consultant for a long time, so addressing those guys for the keynote to me was like just so comfortable and joyous because I was flattered to be asked at all, and I miss that community, and it's hard to be outside of schools, and, you know, I love my job, but it takes place in a cubicle. You know, it's just not the same as being in schools. Um, so I think I kind of meant building my brand in the sense that now I work in this gigantic media organization, and, you know, I have, I have a lot of Twitter followers, and I follow a lot of journalists, and everything's about building your brand. When you're a teacher, it's not at all about building your brand. Right. It's two such different worlds. And my talk was really about kind of bringing together what I've learned in the last seven years. You know, when I was a writing project teacher, as I said in this talk, I kept a journal every day. I wrote with my students every single time they wrote for 10 years because the writing project told me to, and I took it really literally, and that was probably dumb of me, but it just, I did. I never did anything with that writing, and then now I have this job, and I can see every day how there's a million people like me that are writing with their students, you know, writing projects all over this country and not doing anything with it and thus not part of the conversation. And, you know, I kind of spend the whole day monitoring the conversation, but from a cubicle at the New York Times, 
so the the reporting goes big. You, know, you saw that uh, if you read the Times that maybe last weekend, the weekend before, the whole front of Sunday Review was about the Common Core, and all of a sudden, all kinds of normal civilians that I know, you know, in my real life, are saying, "What about this Common Core? What do you think, Catherine?" And it's like for for us, for everyone here, we've been worrying about the Common Core for a couple of years now, but it only now just hit their consciousness because the Times covered it. So. That's a really strange disconnect for me all the time. That that, that everybody I know who's so smart, like everybody here, and you know all the people I know in the New York City Writing Project, just aren't getting their thoughts out there in a in a public enough way. And those seizing the conversation are you know journalists doing as good a job as they can, but they're not teachers or or you know the political people who are political or of course the stakeholders from a financial point of view or whatever. Um, so my frustration is just, come on, writing project people, get those journals and do something with them. Catherine, tell people where your journals are stored. Oh, so, yeah, that's in my little speech, but I'm sitting on that bed right now. When my husband and I first got married, um, well, when he first moved in with me, he was horrified by my, like, listing piles of, you know, this is pre-computer, like, everything was handwritten. So he built a bed for us to fit in our apartment. It was a weird size. The whole um, headboard... I think maybe you can, no, well, you can't see it here. The whole headboard is for the storage of my teacher journals, literally, because um, he just needed them out of the way. So every night they're pressing against my head for the last 20 years. So, you know, I need to, someday I need to do something for this journal. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, Catherine, can you, I, this wasn't in your speech, I don't think, or uh, your talk, um, but. I tried to write for the blog, um, the learning blog, or what, mm -hmm. whatever part of it. The teachers can sometimes. You have guests there, um, and you talked to me at that point about how there's a different attitude about editing and getting things out and and so forth between writing project and. Oh you know, yeah, the New York I, Times. I mean, I didn't want to say this publicly because I know that's why I thought <laughs> writing project. Here but we go. My, honestly, I said I told this to Steve and he laughed because he knows it. My huge frustration with the writing project is people treat writing there like English teachers treat writing. It's like, oh, I'm working on my piece. I'm going to gestate it and maybe we'll take it to groups and, you know, maybe in a year a few groups will have given me comments and it's like, no, you got to write like a journalist. Like, there's a news hook or there's something you're upset about or your school's being closed or you just, like Jen, you just came from a terrible standardized testing situation that America doesn't know about. You need to write that up in 24 hours and you need to send it somewhere or you've missed your moment. And I don't feel like writing, you know, the writing project approaches writing that way and they need to do it more. If they want to have, if they want to have a voice in the larger conversation, anyway. Mm -hmm. That's very practical. That's interesting. Yeah. Jen, do you want to tell your story a little bit? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, could I introduce? Just say that um, one of the, I, I wanted to pose the question this way because when I searched your name, I, I found this wonderful video. I think from yeah. 2012, right? Yeah. On mm -hmm. teacher, teacher. On the teaching channel. On the teaching show, right? Yeah, the which shows channel. you um, in the classroom telling a wonderful story um, in the classroom. But I, but I wanted to kind of ask you um, to to maybe draw some contrast or connection between telling the, that kind of story and telling the kind of story you you told on the school book. Is that a fair enough setup? Sure, yeah. sure. So for me, what always happens is. Um, a very weirdly and luckily, I've got to run in some cool circles with some cool English ed people. Um, and I did a lot of work with NCTE, so I was in a lot of conversations. In fact, I was sitting next to David Coleman when he introduced us to NCTE, to the Common Core, the first no. time in Washington, D.C. And uh, we kind of joke now sometimes that we could have taken him out at the time, but we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was sitting six inches to my right, and I didn't know. Um, <laughs> But uh, so um, actually both of those stories are quite similar. Uh, when, you, when you are on the board of directors at NCTE, you're in a section. If we're probably all NCTE members or know of NCTE. And so for the secondary section, I was asked to write like a little from the secondary section thing. And it was really funny because I knew that my piece was going to be in the centennial um, uh, issue. So I was going to write all about how like, 
I'd been at NCTE for all these different times, and it, you know, like since I was 22, I'd been going to convention. And then um, the editor uh, said, D -d -d "But don't write about convention." And I was like, "Oh, but it's due like Monday. What should I write about?" So I just kind of wrote about like what was happening in my classroom right then. Three things mm. I knew for sure about being a teacher because it happened to be my 20th year in the classroom. And so um, I was like, so in 20 years, this is what I know for sure. And from that little tiny article, which really was, like Catherine said, sort of like on the spot, here's what's happening in my classroom, here's what happened Friday afternoon, I was writing it on a Sunday morning, it, you know, like I got a lot of, I got to go on the teaching channel and tell a story about um, something that was happening in my classroom. They came in and filmed a, uh, um, one of my a lesson they were looking for lessons which happened to be common core aligned um, and so uh, and in the similar way when I moved from high school to middle school I, I, I didn't realize what was happening in terms of testing in high school in middle school uh, high school teachers in New York are all about the regions everything in the world is all about the regions and we didn't they're really not aware that in the middle of April, like the entire all of love and joy is sucked from the world because testing happens to third through eighth graders. And, um, and so the Sunday morning before the ELA test, the week of the ELA test, I just wrote on our, our New York City listserv, uh, writing project listserv, hey, you guys, here's what's just, if you know a middle school teacher or an elementary school teacher, here's what you should do this week. You should be nice to them because their week sucks, basically. <laughs> and I kind of said, this is what's happening this week for people. This is what it's like to be in those classrooms during the testing days. And Catherine immediately responded to me and she said, you should write this up. And I was like... Who's on the list there also, by the way? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, to be, it was so funny because I was like sitting, drinking coffee on the couch on Sunday morning and like, write it up. It was, it was a post on a listserv. Um, but literally that afternoon and into the evening and the next day, Catherine and I sort of <laughs> shot the, the um, post back and forth. And by, I think, that Monday afternoon, it was on this desk of school book and published Tuesday morning when the test started. And so it really was that minute-by-minute minute thing. And it came exactly from what I knew was happening in my classroom that week and how I thought other people should know that, too. Do you just, just, so just want to briefly say what school book is? Um, yeah. I want to hear that. Um, Schoolbook is a blog that is, and Catherine, you can jump in here and correct me because I'm sort of, I might be misrepresenting it. It's a blog that came from the New York Times, I think, initially, and then broke off. Um, um, a couple of years ago, the Times and WNYC, which is our NPR station, mm -hmm. started this together. Um, now WNYC does it alone, but I have a ton of contacts over there. So I said, Jen, send it to me, and I can get it to the editor. And she was like, Thank you. She wrote me in huge capital letters. Thank you. Because it was fantastic. Like, you know, school book wants this kind of, they, they're they looking for in the moment reporting like this, you know, yeah. from and, real and teachers. What's school was, book's mission sort of thing? It's New York City school reporting, but it's also gone bigger in that they try to, like uh, InsideSchools.org, which is a New York City only thing that lets you in on what's going on in each school. They tried to take part of that mission on and have um, reporting about each school, but also inviting parents and teachers on to talk about the schools, um, you know, individually as well as like citywide concerns. It's also though, if I could say, like the first source a lot of people go to to find test scores and so mm -hmm. forth. Is that, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is kind of <laughs> odd too. I think in some way that I don't know. I mean, it's great there, Jen. You get to publish there. But. Well, it was good that they were interested in a different way to look at what was happening for testing. I think that a lot of parents send their kids to school and they don't know what happens when the test occurs. Mm -hmm. And so I just sort of said, "Here's what it looks like in a classroom." Um. Patrick, go ahead. I, by the way, apologies for the sneezing. I thought I was muted. Yeah. Oh, Paul keeps muting me, and then I think I thought I was muted. I um, would give you, I would give you tissue too. But, uh, I have <laughs> tissues. That's why. I'm, that's why I've been closing off my video. Uh, right. Here's a question that I have for for all of you. Um, this sort of notion of teacher voice. I I, I, I uh, put a bravo into the chat room on the whole notion that um, writing project could, in all of its invitationals, I think, and in a lot of its professional development, talk about writing 
for the real world as opposed to writing for the classroom. Okay, so that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I didn't catch that. Well, go ahead, Beth is Somebody just coming in. Oh, so okay. Um, so my, my question is, is there really a dearth of writers with teacher voices, or is there a dearth of readers for teacher voices? And here's what I mean. You follow Rabbit, you follow Fred Klonsky, you, you follow whoever, and a lot of the issues repeat themselves geographically throughout the country. So the same issues around Common Core, around teacher autonomy, around um, teacher voice, um, all this stuff gets repeated, but it doesn't seem to have any impact on the big stories that get run in the Times or the Los Angeles Times or the San Francisco Chronicle. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is why haven't the very articulate teacher voices that are already present had an effect on the conversation? And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they have had an effect. It's just that from my perspective out here in San Francisco, it sure feels like um, the horse, <laughs> the horse is out of the barn, and most of the people working inside the barn don't even turn around to look at the door. <laughs> what a metaphor! It was probably stretched. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess what I'm asking, uh, you know, one of the things that I was reading this week, I'm reading the payoff by uh, Jeff Connaughton. Um, it, it's a story about Wall Street and a guy who had worked on Wall Street and then went into, um, you know, government service and basically sold out and then he got out again. But, but the thing about it to me is it's this incredible uncovering of what's happening in the halls of power that makes, make these decisions. And I want to know how teacher voices can get into those hallways where Arnie Duncan is making his decision about, Arnie and Randy Weingarten are making their decision about, oh, we'll delay Common Core for one year and then everything will be all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have, I have a response Andrea, to Patrick's yeah, question. Yeah, I want to hear Andrea's thoughts, yeah. and I, I have one too. <laughs> and we'll introduce you, Beth, in just one second. Go ahead, oh, Go ahead okay. Andrea. Um, this is a really bad echo, so I'm getting distracted now. Okay, so I, I, when I hear you say that, I, I understand what you're saying, Patrick, and I actually, um, I think I told Steve this story about how I was at, um, we had our local Michigan public radio had a, I forget what they call it, issues in ale or something, and they were talking about funding for K-12 and this and that, and a bunch of us teachers went, and one of the panelists stood up and said, you know, when I hear teachers talking about education policy, all I hear them talking about are benefits and pensions and money. This is a bunch of grown-ups fighting about power in the, you know, and they're not talking about students. And I was horrified, of course, because I had been one of those people, like, at <laughs> the rallies or whatnot. And I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, this is, this is a real problem because in Michigan, at least, we tend to organize along our unions, which, I mean, I love my union. I'm still in a teacher's union as a graduate student um, because I teach at the university. And so, you know, I love my union, but I wonder sometimes if that, that strength of our organizations there sometimes drown out the other conversations that we could publicly be having because those conversations about money and power are catnip to journalists and then also make it very easy for us to be demonized uh, because we're trying to you know protect our livelihood which is of course important but then that obscures the other conversations and you know for me what that what that personally looks like because you know, I really subscribe to like be the change you wish to see. That means that I go to the my state representatives' coffee hours when they're at the corner grocery store. I make sure they're all programmed into my cell phone. 
I pay really close attention to what's happening in our state capital, state capital, mm -hmm. because the people who end up in Washington start out at the state level, right? Arnie Duncan was a Chicago guy, and a lot uh, in a <laughs> sorry, lot of, folks, <laughs> right? I know. I mean, but the people who had his ear at the time and still do. Right, that was because of a whole culture around school reform in Chicago, and you know, I wonder. I'm, I'm not. I have not. I can't even speak to Chicago at all. But like, I for us in Michigan, I just wonder sometimes if we sometimes put the cart before the horse in terms of what's good for kids, and if sometimes we need to organize around what the kids need in a almost the same manner as we do for our own livelihoods, which are equally important. I'm not saying they're not, but we, I don't think we do a good job of selling the car. Um, like that guy said at the Issues in Ale, we don't sell the car very well of what we know to be good for kids. Um, and all they hear is that we're talking about our pensions, and that's not what teachers are talking about. I don't think. Most teachers I know only talk about that like once a year when it comes up. They're really talking about Common Core and the over reliance on testing and the, you know, neoliberal reforms that are just pounded down our throats. And so, I don't know. That's what I think about it. Do you, do you want to keep talking a little bit? And uh, you put a, a link you know, on the Titan Pad and talk about what happened just today. Or? Yeah. So that so. is an example. That's an example mm -hmm. of totally grassroots. Um, movement to go take on Lansing. So we are now a right to work state in Michigan. So that fight was lost. And uh, you know, the unions are particularly hamstringed now. And so what you see is that people have the time <laughs> to go in and have those conversations now. And so people are organizing via Facebook, they're organizing via Twitter. We have a really good uh, set of progressive blogs that keep people really informed and also our public radio deserves a shout out in Michigan. So these things are going out along, I mean we have our own Michigan Ed chat um, hashtag and a chat so that people can organize that way and talk about what policies are coming through beyond just the conversations about money. What's interesting is the link that I put up is that despite that they were in there not talking about funding necessarily. Those teachers were talking about the over-reliance on testing, some of these other issues that we've sort of talked around tonight. But what our governor came back with was purely pupil, pure pupil spending. So it's interesting because even when you try to change the conversation about what are, what are our policies and what does that look like in the classroom for our students and for our learners, how is it impacting learning, then the conversation comes right back to per pupil spending. <laughs> You're like, okay, we're back to money. We're back to the money conversation. That's the last word in the article. And it, it's interesting to me because I, I think when you talk to parents, um, and I'm also going to be a public school parent in the fall, my kids start kindergarten, my twins, as we were discussing earlier, um, you know, Parents aren't, they're not really worried about what the per pupil spending is. They worry about what's happening in their kid's classroom and the, how empowered their kid's classroom teacher is to do right by the students that are sitting in those desks. And so I, I believe that the even micro local within the local school district and at the state level is really a good place to put our efforts and like let Arnie Duncan say whatever Arnie Duncan's going to say. You know, he's going to be gone in a couple years, and we're going to have who knows what, <laughs> you know, broad, Eli Broad <laughs> trained guy up in there next because that's what, that's what talks right now. But meanwhile, the, we can be doing our work where we can see it in our communities, and eventually enough of those drops in a bucket is going to fill that bucket and overflow it, and we can really change it. That's what I, I can't believe anything other than that because... Mm -hmm. So, it just makes sense to me that that's can, the way can, to go. Can I share two quick, quick stories related to that um, that have really struck me? One is what's happened in Texas where when enough parents started bugging their state legislators, all of a sudden those legislators, and especially those who also had kids in the school, started becoming aware of all these tests that they had voted for that were now affecting their children 
and uh, a lot of you have probably followed this, but I thought it was really interesting. When enough parents spoke up, suddenly the legislature, in a kind of a heavy-handed manner, it's true, said, wait a minute, too many tests in high school. Instead of 15 or 30 tests for uh, every kid over the four years, there can only be five. Now, there are probably five lousy tests, but I still think that's better than 15 or 30. And it, it shows uh, a moment when uh, pressure actually did result in political change. The other one, and the one that really started me on all this, was when uh, Planned Parenthood uh, said they were going to cut back, no, when, when the uh, Susan Coleman Foundation said they were going to cut back funding, stop giving funding to Planned Parenthood, and thousands of, of people tweeted them and they backed down. And at that point, there were a number of education, education bloggers who said, how come teachers never do this? Um, because when there were, like Andrea is saying, when there were enough drops in the bucket, that stopped them in their tracks. I, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this, but I feel like I am witnessing real pushback right now. We got some lag going on there. Um, yeah, something weird happened. You know, I mean, I understand what all of you are saying. <laughs> about how things are covered and, you know, how... Catherine, there's something weird with your voice. Catherine, ...concerns you... about pension. Oh, there it goes. Catherine, could you just repeat that? <laughs> now she's totally frozen. Okay. She will be back, I hope, and we'll remember... Catherine, can you talk? are you there uh, now? There you are. You're good now. I think I'm here. Yeah, but repeat well, what you said because it my was... network connection. Yeah, and, and it was it... all I wanted to say in short is that I spend all day reading Twitter. Uh... Oh no, <laughs> that's a funny way to jump out. Anyway, she'll come back. I'm sure, and we'll we'll work it out. In the meantime, Beth, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, talk to us a little bit about how you're thinking about teacher voice down there in Alabama? Am I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Am I too loud? I have a very loud voice. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, so Beth Sanders, I teach social studies in um, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Yay, Birmingham. Third year, <laughs> third year teacher. Um, have been kind of doing what I call teacher voice from the beginning. So doing that through blogging and Twitter. Twitter was kind of my first um, in, and mainly because I felt like an island in my school. Um, I was like so confused why every teacher was what I call a telling teacher and is lecturing and you know nothing's happening and everyone's talking about the end of your test and I'm like no this can't be my life like this isn't what I signed up for so kind of immediately went to the internet and found started finding people that were talking about things and jumping into Twitter chats left and right and kind of creating a network of people um, I think that I, I think what she was trying to say was that she's seeing this happen every single day and she's seeing it through Twitter and through blogging and I would jump on that same train and say I'm using my Twitter, my teacher voice literally from 7 a.m. until 2 a.m. 90% of my life um, through digital tools but I think the other thing that I'm trying to do is empower student voice like student voice that's not controlled by adults but really just figuring out how to give them the information and the tools to get their voices heard. So my argument is that the more we empower the youth and students to use their voice, then the more effective teacher voice is going to become. Um, and when, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I would like to think that my students could speak on um, empowerment in my classroom or what we're trying to do in our school as much as I could. Like, that's my hope. Um, and I also think as far as the movement is concerned, that student voice has to be a part of teacher speaking out. Um, and I think a lot of teachers are just scared or they don't care. Right. And I, I don't want to come off like I think most teachers, absolutely not. But a lot are misinformed and don't care enough and maybe do care a little bit too much about their pension and a little less about um, how this is affecting our society. So. Thank you. Great. I mean, I, one response I have is that I, I, I think we have seen sometimes 
it's true of myself that um, you know working on student voice is really really important and 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 um, and I appreciate that it doesn't absolutely like it doesn't mean that the the teacher voice gets raised at the same time I think we need to work on both and some you know sometimes there those of us advocating for youth voice need to get <laughs> our teacher voice out there more too perhaps absolutely but, yeah. Uh, Catherine, do you want to make your point again? Sorry. Uh, I'll do my uh, best quickly. Yeah, I, I just, I, it started with you, you're, you're not Pollyannish, but. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I think your question, Patrick, right, is your name? Pa Patrick. Yeah, I think your question really made me sit. I mean, I want to write it down and really think about it. Um, but my, But as I'm listening to other people, I'm thinking, yes, but I have seen a real swell of pushback. And I don't mean just black and white. Um, about about any particular issue, but push back in the sense of complicating the conversation recently online. Um, you know, either via Twitter or more and more people publishing in the various places where you can publish MindShift or you know EdWeek or wherever it is. Um, mm -hmm. Just talking about what the Common Core is going to mean, specifically about the Common Core, um, and trying to separate the notion of what it's going to look like in testing as to what the actual Common Core is asking for and how it was, you know, how it came about, etc. Um, and I feel like, you know, the fact that yesterday Arning Duncan announced that there'll be whatever it is this year, grace period, and, you know, is in part because, um, every, you know, he's hearing from teachers everywhere and parents everywhere that this is way too much, way too fast. So. Yeah, that's, I don't know, does that sound Pollyannish? But I do feel like it's starting to work, at least in regards to that one issue. Well, What's MindShift? All those. Oh, all it's, those. One, it's a blog that's, um, you know, about teaching and learning, essentially. But it's just one of the many places that I see interesting stuff I respect about what learning looks like. Uh, okay. KQED, I think, supports it, which is out mm -hmm. in the Bay Area, right? Yes. Ah. Patrick, did you want to come back on this dialogue, which I think is healthy, by the way. Because <laughs> I can say. Well, we don't hear you, Patrick. Uh, how do we, um, I keep unmuting go. it. Is, does that work? There yeah. You go. All right. I, 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 but I could be wrong, and that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight. Um, I recognize the pushback. Um, I mean, the greatest example of that, I think, is Murrow and his um, mm -hmm. forced uh, pursuit of Michelle Ree. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Murrow is about to release this um, big, long documentary on NOLA, on, on New Orleans, <laughs> and the decimation of that public school system as some kind of success story, at least from what I can read in his anticipatory statements. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I'm not saying that teacher voices are not engaged now in a healthy way in this argument. What, what I'm concerned about is that those voices are not in the hallways where the conversations about what's going to happen next are happening. Mm -hmm. And, and the organizations that I assumed stupidly and naively would be in those hallways to influence those conversations are the AFT, the NEA, the National Writing Project, and NCTE. And as far as I can tell, they sort of dropped the ball. But that's me being half-empty glass person. <laughs> <laughs> Got lots of metaphors tonight. So not all of them Sorry. farm metaphors, but a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, being in Birmingham uh, back in April was a huge, what a huge learning experience for me. Um, and um, uh, because we, we heard from all these people who had participated back in 1963. And what really struck me was the level of in depth really smart organization. Um, I mean, Martin Luther King was a big part of that, but there were other organizers and they were so smart about how to get kids, parents, teachers 
really active uh, in a way that was effective and nonviolent and strategic and then negotiating when the time came when the heat was really on and they had these this the, the, this thing called the court of conscience I had never heard this phrase I just thought that they there was so much they did that was really smart and of course it really catapulted them to national prominence and effectiveness as well and uh, but that's a long path of of detailed organization. That's why I was so I so admired Jesse Hagopian on the last discussion because he is one of those smart organizers, and I think that we need more of them. So, is raising is teachers speaking up? Is that movement one step along the path of organizing, or <laughs> I hope it is, but I I, did, I, I don't know if it is. Or, or do we just need more organizing going on? It's not Thanks, real organizing. Paul, it's not real organizing the way Jesse did it. You know, right. really right. Um, g building trust uh, person by person, you know, in a, in a school, in a community, and then, you know, moving it to the point where it was available when action was needed. Um, that's hard nitty-gritty work and uh, and what I'm doing is kind of more much more at a distance uh, I'm hoping it's contributing but it, it's not the same thing I don't think I want to say it does contribute and hey look you know we need we need voices we need stories we need all that um, so yeah I don't want to say it's not I just want to think about the connections <laughs> a little bit Anybody else want to jump in? <laughs> What's your question? You want to ask the group here? I, I want to ask, I, I, I want to hear more from people about, um, I'm really looking for ways to, to get the voices out there, um, at least into newspapers, you know, and, and public media more. And one of the things I worry about is that even when they do get out, it it tends to be in in circles that are still turn inward to the teacher community instead mm -hmm. of outward into the community you know and I worry about those blogs and the, the Twitter stuff sounds great and it's a step in the direction in terms and Andrea is using really using it more as a tool to then you know influence legislators and that's good but um, and I'm frustrated about that. I had this great, I organized this great um, uh, little round table with Chicago Tribune editors back in December and I had a group of teachers, small group and some editors and the editors were really excited and interested and all and I thought oh this is cool, this is the first step, now I'm getting inside and, and we're gonna get some stories published and so forth and then after that I emailed them and said okay I got some stories now, next step, silence. So it's like, and and that's and and I don't know. I'm hoping Catherine and others may have some some suggestions for that. I I feel like Kevin Hodgson's is the one of the best things I've seen in terms of a partnership between a writing project and local newspapers. So they're publishing stuff from teachers every month. That's that's you know that's the better model than, you know compared to what Catherine was describing. Can, so can you describe the suggestions more? you know for how to get it out there? That's what but I want to hear. Steve, describe that a little more. What what's uh, what's Kevin doing? Each Kevin, yeah. do 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 does everybody know about it? Do people? In, I'm pointing yeah. at all the pictures okay. on my screen. Wow, you should go to the go to the Western Massachusetts Writing Project. My son lives up there, but I'm always busy visiting our new grandson. So, but I've got to have breakfast with him. He with with Kevin. He um, because he was a journalist. Okay, he he knew how to work this, and he I went to the local newspaper, the Hampshire Gazette. I know it. I used to live there, and he worked out a deal. They they have they they feature you know local people writing columns and so he convinced them that once a month they should have a teacher contributing and it would be a different teacher each time and they they're tell writing about their classroom they're not complaining they're not you know they're not fighting some big fight they are just acquainting people with what it means you know to really be a teacher making things happen in school and um, and so 
uh, he really he put that together, and it's ongoing. And, and it's reaching can, out to an audience beyond teachers. Right. Ac what absolutely. What happens yeah. is the parents see it in the newspaper, and then they t they put it up on their refrigerators, and then the kids it's come fun. and say to the teacher, "Oh, yeah, I saw the article you wrote." And so it really um, hasn't. It it. it, it I mean, it penetrates, you know, in the area. It's very local, but it's pretty cool. And you can see some of those articles. I think they've still got some of them posted mm -hmm. that you can access on their website. And I put it, some of them on Teacher Speak Up too. So that's the Kevin story. Um, so if I can just jump in for a second. Please. Sorry, I missed a whole bunch of what you said because everything just crashed at my house oh, at dear. once. The computer, the internet, but I'm back. <laughs> um, so just to kind of piggyback what Steven's is what Steve is saying is um, both of the articles that I had published in school book were literally like here's what's happening in my classroom they weren't really complainy articles they right. were sort of articles about this is what it's like when the test is going on I can't talk to your kids I'm not allowed to say anything I'm not allowed to hold a pencil they can't get up and go to the bathroom it, it's just and it wasn't written in, an, in sort of a complaining, it was kind of written in a very matter-of-fact um, tone, I think. And um, at the end, I, I just kind of said, so here's what you can do. You can make sure your kids have extra hugs this morning. And if you have a teacher, buy them a cup of coffee or actually give them an apple. And, and then <laughs> at the end, I said, you know, like, and then you could go talk to your local politician because they should know about this too. And I actually had a second piece on School Book about in New York, the teachers go and um, grade the tests of the kids in the city. Uh, you're, I was released from my classroom, forcibly released from my classroom for five days right. after Me this too. test. I yeah. like that, I like that <laughs> phrase, forcibly released. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was forcibly released. It was not fun. <laughs> the whole time I was like, what's happening there? Um, and uh, so the second time I wrote about, like, this is what it's like when your kids' tests get graded. Um, this is what the teachers talk about at the table. And this is what Pearson says when they come and train us. And this is what I do when I grade a kid's test. I actually look at the kid's name first to make sure I know whose test I'm grading rather than just some random sixth grader. Um, and I think that in both of those cases, it sort of reminded me of, uh, when I was on working with NCTE, I got to go, I was a part of a small committee called the Governmental Relations Committee, and around the, um, around the time where we go to the Capitol and kind of talk to senators, we went a, a couple days ahead of time, and the people in this very small committee got to go to Capitol Hill and talk to a bunch of uh, education aides to the top senators uh, in the both House and Senate committees. And what they wanted to say, what all of those aides said was, our bosses don't really want to hear you complaining. We know you don't like tests. Tell us about your classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's definitely like what Steve is saying that Kevin is doing is yeah. really important right. to say, not like everything's terrible and help us out. Quit, quit telling us that we're terrible. Quit, blah, blah. Tests aren't going to go away. They've spent too much money on them, quite frankly. I'm not going to throw away a really expensive outfit if I buy it. They're not going to throw away really expensive <laughs> tests. But, you know, like, so what yeah, do you say? <laughs> don't you, don't, but can I, can I play, uh, push back a little bit on that and say, I see what I worry about in that, in that narrative that you just said, Jen, is it feels to me like he's, they're silencing your voice and saying, I, you know, just tell us stories. You well, know? And, actually, and so I, I worry a little bit about that, you know? Well, so do what, I. Play. So. Well, what I actually, I worry too, but I think that, I'm not sure that the voices were being silenced as much as they were saying, you have a couple of sound bites that you say because you're a teacher and we've heard them from every teacher. You don't like tests. Yep, we know. So what else can you tell us about what's happening? Um, because we already know that you don't like tests and we're still having them. So maybe the story could be, we know you don't like, like, I don't want to go to the doctor and have a bunch of tests but I kind of need some tests sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But what does my doctor do with those testing results? And as, as a person having tests, can I say, I don't want that many? Or, um, no, I'm not going to have that one. Can I have some autonomy and some voice in it? Um, I think that we're naive if we, if we say, 
we're just trying to get rid of all of this because it's not going to go away. And I think that we need to do what Andrea is saying, which is do really local stuff and make sure that we're listening locally and talking locally and also that we're telling stories from our classroom that are about how what's happening on a, on a um, legal level and uh, is affecting what goes on at 9 o'clock in the morning in room A205. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I mean, there's there's tons that I haven't thought of, I haven't sort of made a list of this, but just in, in the course of my job over the last seven years, to, to me, like, there's some how, sort of how to pitch a journalist, how to pitch a paper, how to get your writing out there is a course in and of itself, right? Like, it's kind of what Jen's saying. If you want to say a message they already expect to hear from you, you have to upend it, make it interesting, make it news people can use, make it... Uh, okay. Make it hooky, you know. Um, start it with a great story. Find a um, actual thing right. going on in the news that they need a teacher voice to explain to people. They, you can't like obviously getting published, you know, on the Times op-ed page is is no slam dunk for anybody. So I would also echo Andrea and say you start small with your local paper, like this thing that Kevin's doing, which I didn't know about, is amazing, and it's a mm -hmm. small local paper. And that's, I mean, I mean, I think it's, you know, you have to kind of, the teachers I've seen that have kind of cracked this wall have been very savvy about figuring out what is this place that I am targeting to get my thing published actually publish, how can I make my thing fit their journalistic, you know, uh, vision, and how can I make what I'm doing something they need. Um, and that's a lot of work on you as a writer, yes, but... It, it's also just becomes a habit of thinking. Um, I think it's a habit journalists have. They, you know, they have something they want to say, and they'll they could write it six different ways depending on the publication they want to put it in. Um, so maybe that's just something teachers need quick training in, or something as part of a, uh, you know, a little boot camp, like a weekend boot camp where everybody <laughs> writes their story. But part of it's practical, just about straight pitching and format, you know, is it a visual thing? Is it a essay? Is it a, it can take all kinds of forms now and it might be more palatable as a photo essay, say, um, than, like you said, same message all the time from the same, you know, plus the other problem, and you guys all know this, and it drives me crazy on the time site, every human went to school. So if there's an article in the Times and it's open to comment by civilians about teaching, Everyone needs to write in about what happened when they were a student. Right. And they need to write in about when their kids were students. It, it, it's so many layers before they can get to actually thinking about teaching and learning. They have to filter it. I mean, we all do. That's how we think about anything. But when you read reams and reams of it for years, you just realize that people are going to have to think about their own orientation to classrooms first. That's... You know. Catherine, could you? I know you're a really busy person, but if you could write a one page or even <laughs> less little guide on how to pitch your story, uh, summarizing things you just said, I want to put it right up as a post in Teachers Speak Up, <laughs> and I think we should get it out there. But it that really teachers need to hear that, and I, I think it's really on target. Well, I'll I think about it a little. I'm not. Pretending I have any, you know, secret sauce, but no, yeah, no, I, no, no. Don't now. Listen, you're do. a journalist. Don't think about it too long. Just write it, girl. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Come back to bite me. <laughs> Steve, she good. should, she should absolutely do that. But I, I gotta say that part of what I heard Catherine say is, is you gotta, you gotta know your local place. You know, it's not, it's like there's not one, one way of doing it that's going to fit every place. Um, I, I True. Think. So, but, but and no, can I just say one, just from a teacher perspective, like I'm Beth, sitting in this ahead, coffee, yes. I'm sitting in this coffee shop right now with another teacher. She's a first year teacher, and I'm a third year teacher, and I've been working since 9 a.m. and it's summer, and I'm working with another colleague to write a book to get our voices heard. Um, Sometimes a lot of these teachers are so committed to their classrooms. Yeah. I've been a twelve-hour day in the summer. Um, my, my biggest concern is not making sure that I get this out on a blog, although I've also challenged myself to blog every single day so my voice is being heard. Um, and I'm jumping into this because I think it's really important, but just kind of as an advocate for what I call real educators. We're sitting here and she has a glass of wine, granted, but it's literally we've been working since 9 a.m. Um, and she's still hammering away planning for next year. And we teach in 
extreme poverty situations where parents aren't exactly available and I'm not getting any parent um, input and my mayor has no idea what's going on in our schools you know so it's very and we just what happened yesterday was the accountability act was passed in Alabama and they posted oh, 77 schools that are failing and now can get a tax credit after they pay for private school um, my middle school was on that list and seven schools from her district were on that list so I would love to get my voice out there but she's a first year teacher and I just got tenure um, so I'm trying to make sure that my students that already have all of these circumstances against them get the best from me every single day um, and I'm trying to tweet my heart out in 140 characters about that and blog about it every single day in a terrible unedited way but that's where the teacher voice lives um, and so I feel like the more I can empower my students to be organizers and to get out there and care about what's going on and do things that matter and demand from their teachers and their schools a learning experience that is real, that's how I feel like my voice is being heard more often than not. We yeah. have, wow, yeah. thank you. Beth, can you keep talking <laughs> and, yeah. and announce what's the story we're going to tell next week? Um, you're coming on again next week. Yes. yes. Um, so I am, yeah, uh, I'm volunteering as a Brave New Voices, for a Brave New Voices coach for the Birmingham team. So we have um, six students that are high school students from the schools in Birmingham, and they're traveling to Chicago for Brave New Voices, which is an international poetry competition. Um, and it's completely funded by people who are donating. We still need to raise about $3,000. They're practicing three hours a day, three days a week, and God knows how much um, on their own. And so we're just kind of going to come on, and I think the students are going to do some of their work. John Paul Taylor runs a nonprofit called Real Life Poets. So when you're speaking on Birmingham organizers, organizing a big reason that we're even going to Brave New Voices is because it's 50 years after 1963, and we feel like everyone's talking about what happens in the South in Alabama. Our hope is that our students' voices will be heard about what it actually is like in Bombingham 50 years later um, and <laughs> what's actually happening here. So, it, And that's what I mean about student voice and actually giving them the space to express themselves without it being edited by me whatsoever. I'm just like, hey, look at this statistic. What do you think about it? Um, and so it's really just going to be when, about when that. And, when and where is Brave New Voices happening again? Brave New Voices is in Chicago. It's an international poetry competition. I think there's 26 different states that are in it, um, and from the United States. And it's like the seventh through the eleventh, and it's through Youth Speaks, and it's been going on for a while. HBO did a documentary in like 2010, um, and it's spoken words, slam poetry. And so, who's coming on next week? Just be uh, a little more specific. John Paul John Paul Taylor, who is the um, the founder of Real Life Poets, and um, Al, who you have had on before when we did Youth Converts Culture, who is a volunteer coach as well, and I think three of the slam poets and myself. Well, that sounds exciting. So I want you to come back next Wednesday. Um, and and I purposely did not call this, you know, part two of two, because I this is something that I think we need to keep talking about. I think uh, people brought up a lot of great issues tonight and I want to thank you all. I do want to give a, a brief moment if anybody wanted to have a last word. I'm not going to go to everybody, but if anybody's been sitting on one last thing they wanted to say, please go ahead. <laughs> Send me a teacher story or two or a place <laughs> where I can publish them. Help! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, see, and, and one of my last questions and it's not, uh, the answer is everything. And here's the question: um, Like, where to publish, right? Like, uh, what what are what are the advantages of publishing on a site like yours, Stephen? Where you know it's a collection of of voices, publishing on your own blog, seeking out um, you know local newspapers, finding ways to get in the New York Times, whatever. Um, and and probably the answer is do it all. But yeah, but I think see, mine. I, that, yeah. I I don't. Not that you know. Who's reading mine? More teachers. Mine. I, I'm just trying to. You. If I you publish them, it's to encourage other people. Uh, but I, I'm trying to use Patch.com now, and but not everybody has Patch. Um, and uh, so you know, we do here in Evanston. Um, but you can start your own blog there, and that's a. It's it's an online news site. So um, people should check that out in their own local area. I, I think there probably is. There are probably are patch.com sites in, 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 in the Bay Area. Yeah. And um, I, that yeah, could be a great place. I've already put up three stories, and I've gotten comments. 
Um, I'd also like to say, just to kind of um, also for an authentic teacher voice and to kind of piggyback on what Beth was saying, um, you, to, be, to write your teacher story, it's, it doesn't need to be long and it doesn't need to be layered and it doesn't need to, it, right. can, it can be like, here's the snapshot of this five minutes in my class. Literally, the second piece I had, I had published on um, school book was about the fact that before I grade each kid's test, I turn it over and look at the kid's name and I said, this is what's on the label. Like... I know who the kid lives with from the label. I know what their birthday is. I know what neighborhood they live in. And I sort of picture that part of the city in my head so that the kid's paper that I'm reading has more consideration for me than this is the 748th essay about like rock climbing I've read in the last two hours. Now, Jen, um, you know, of course they are going to, and I think they actually this year are, are scanning all of them. Scanning. And, yeah. and, and yeah. they're going to pop oh, up Lord. on the computer screen and you're not going to be able to see who they are. But anyway, yeah, and, but, but, hey, but, as long as we can do that, go for it. But, well, but send, me those, saying, send me your stories, Jen. Can you email I, them to I, me? I absolutely will. But what I'm saying is yeah. the whole crux of that story was I turn over a paper and read a label and here's what's on a label. And that's what I mean. Like your teacher's story, your authentic teacher's story doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be the whole story of every conversation you had with a kid. It can be, <laughs> I said this one thing, and here's what four people said back to me, and I thought this. That can be your teacher's story. And, nice. it, and you, it can be four paragraphs long and get out there. I've been very impressed tonight by how there have been big ideas, but lots and lots of very practical you know, here's how you do it. Um, so thank you all for, you know, bridging between those gaps. Um, I just, I just, I, just yeah. Beth, I feel like you're already doing it. Like, yeah. really, it's not, I, I just want to say to you, yeah. I really, yeah. like what you're doing with your kids, to me, like, it, you're doing it. Like, mm -hmm. you're, you are empowering them to speak and they're carrying the message. And, you know, one little tiny tip, I mean, what people can't hear from teachers because of the blah 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 they think we're gonna say they can hear from 15 year olds like the number if you can get your best writer to carry a message about school reform or testing or whatever and work with that kid or maybe even it's a joint effort between you and the kid that little bit of a hook that if it came from a 15 year old I don't know on Twitter you see these people but there's like um I, Nikhil Goya, Zach, there's all these kids who are, you know, out there because they're horrified by certain things going on in school, and they've gotten huge followings be, by the nature of being 15. So keep doing what you're doing, and you know, maybe yes. it's one of your kids that'll do this, but through you. I'm gonna call time, y'all. <laughs> thank, okay. thank you so much. Um, I, I um, want to say that uh, we are um, broadcast on the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that was set up several years ago by Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo. And um, next week, Beth is going to bring a, a, a poetry show. I'm so excited about it. Um, and so come, come join us each Wednesday at this time, and we'll see you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.